Welcome to Building Search Applications with Elasticsearch and AngularJS. My name is Daniel Beach. My goal during this course is to give you the tools that you need to create a robust client-side search application powered by Elasticsearch. Let's take a look at what we will cover throughout the upcoming videos. First, we will take an introductory look at Elasticsearch and what a client-side application is, discover the power of Elasticsearch, and the benefits of using an in-browser application for a search. Next, we will set up our local Elasticsearch environment, see how easy Elasticsearch is to install, and how to configure it for our project. Once we have Elasticsearch up and running, it's time to begin ingesting our data. You'll learn how Elasticsearch works with different data structures and key ingestion concepts. With our working search engine in place, we will explore Elasticsearch's impressive search capabilities and well-structured syntax. The next step is to connect our search engine to a client-side search UI. We will walk through how to show results and filters. In separate sections, we will also cover adding autocomplete and snippet highlighting. No search application is complete without relevancy tuning. We'll learn how to adjust field boosting and scoring functions. Finally, in the last section, we'll talk about how to lock down the Elasticsearch API for security reasons. Now that you have a roadmap of what to expect over the next few hours, let's dive in. In the last video, we outlined the key information that we will be covering in this course. This next video will introduce you to Elasticsearch, outline the benefits of building client-side search applications, and show you how we're going to combine the two in our search server project. Elasticsearch is a powerful data store built on top of Lucene that provides an easy API endpoint for search. Because it can index both structured and unstructured data, Elasticsearch is more than just a full-text search engine. Unstructured data is essentially large blocks of text, like full book chapters. It is usually text-based content and is generally represented as a store of flat documents. On the other hand, structured data is often best represented in multiple levels of hierarchy, such as a JSON structure, or very distinct fields like ISBNs. Elasticsearch is well suited to index and search both of these data types. Additionally, Elasticsearch does not require an explicit data schema. Instead, it automatically categorizes fields based on their content and when they are first encountered. To top it off, Elasticsearch is near real time, meaning that you can search documents almost instantaneously as they are indexed. From an architecture standpoint, Elasticsearch can be used to build robust, distributed databases that scale effectively. Each Elasticsearch cluster can contain multiple indexes split across any number of nodes and replicas. As your data needs grow, more nodes can be added to your cluster and Elasticsearch will automatically rebalance them and route all indexing and searching requests to the correct nodes. During the course, we'll get a detailed understanding of these concepts as we build our search server. Elasticsearch will be the backbone of our application and we can use its simple and clean API to power our search interface. Speaking of client-side search applications, let's quickly go over what a client-side application is and why it is such a powerful concept. Client-side search applications can be used to build powerful user interfaces with minimal resources. If you think about how most search applications function today, a user visits a website, and after they submit a search, the web server sends a query to the database, then takes a response from the database and converts it into HTML before delivering the final page to the user. That means that each page request is rendered by the server before being delivered to the browser. In contrast, client-side applications take advantage of the increasing power of personal computers to render the user interface directly in the browser. In addition to the initial HTML page, a separate JavaScript application is also downloaded that then controls all or at least a percentage of the search interface functionality. This JavaScript application can then make search queries directly to our Elasticsearch instance. Using a client-side application for our search server gives us a number of benefits, including smaller server requirements, we don't need to set up an additional web server, a faster user experience, because all key interactions are happening in the browser, we can display the search results as soon as they return from Elasticsearch. This makes for a very responsive search experience. In this video, we looked at a broad overview of what makes Elasticsearch such a great search engine, as well as the benefits of using a client-side application for the search interface. Over the course of the next few sections, we will be standing up an Elasticsearch server, ingesting our example data, and creating a custom search interface. Combining Elasticsearch with a JavaScript-driven UI will give us a fully featured search application. Let's get started.
In the last video, we introduced Elasticsearch and outlined the benefits of client-side applications. Now in this video, we're going to cover installing Elasticsearch and spinning up our first nodes. We will go over Elasticsearch's default cluster settings and when you might need to override them. The first thing that we'll need to do is to download Elasticsearch from their website. I've already gone ahead and done that and placed it into my folder for this project. You should do the same if you are following along. Let's take a second to look at how Elasticsearch is organized. First, there's the bin folder, which contains all of the Elasticsearch executables. Then we have the configuration files for this node. There's one for Elasticsearch and another for logging. If you prefer to use JSON instead of YAML, you can simply rename the Elasticsearch.yaml file and use the JSON syntax. The data folder holds the actual indexes, and the internal jar files for Elasticsearch are stored in the lib directory. And finally, the logs directory stores useful information for debugging and analysis. There are two additional folders that we will see in the future, plugins and work. One good thing to note is that you should change your primary folder names so they aren't accidentally overwritten when Elasticsearch is upgraded. We're going to go to the Elasticsearch.yaml file and change data to app underscore data and logs to app underscore logs. Next, open up your command line and navigate to your Elasticsearch folder. In order to start Elasticsearch, run bin slash Elasticsearch if you are on a Unix-based system or bin slash Elasticsearch.bat for Windows. You'll need to have the Java Development Kit at least 7 installed. Assuming that all went well, we now have a working instance of Elasticsearch. Let's test that. We're going to go to the Elasticsearch root in our browser. That's localhost port 9200. You should see a response similar to this. Great, now going back to our command line, let's look at a few things that Elasticsearch is doing behind the scenes. The first thing you'll notice is that Elasticsearch automatically created a cluster for us called Elasticsearch and elected a master node. Let's go ahead and rename our cluster to book search just to avoid any future collisions. We'll press control C to stop Elasticsearch and then restart it. Individual nodes are automatically given random names. This node, for instance, is Tommy Lightning. Any node can be the master node unless specifically configured otherwise. One easy way to see an overview of the status of your current cluster is to use Marvel, a dashboard plugin from Elasticsearch. We can install it by running bin slash plugin space dash i space Elasticsearch slash Marvel slash latest. We'll restart Elasticsearch again and then go to the Marvel dashboard in the browser. We can see an overview of all of our nodes. Let's spin up another node just as an example. Once it connects, it will automatically show up here. You can see that it automatically connected to the same cluster. For a local development environment like the one we are currently working with, the default is a single node. We'll go back to just one node for now. The querying syntax for Elasticsearch is the same with one node as it is with 20 nodes. By default, a standard production Elasticsearch cluster of at least two nodes is divided into five shards, each with one replica. This means that every shard also has an accompanying backup shard for a total of 10 shards. The replica shards ensure that data is available even when one of the primary shards goes down, in addition to boosting the overall search performance of the cluster. Keep in mind that replica shards cannot be used for indexing, so increase the number of shards to improve indexing throughput. The only time that you can easily set the number of shards is when you create a new index, but the number of replicas is adjustable at any time. When dealing with memory, it is much more likely that you will hit a memory threshold before maxing out index size of a given node. Of course, this is dependent on your dataset and usage patterns. For our application, the default configuration is more than enough. Just keep in mind that increasing your server's memory is often the first line of defense against performance issues. The more calculations that Elasticsearch can store in memory, the faster it will perform. If you're using a Unix or Linux environment, you should also be aware that there is an mlock setting in the configuration that prevents the Elasticsearch process from being swapped out of memory. We will discuss the number of shards and replication again in later videos, but the Elasticsearch defaults are very sane for the majority of applications. 
So what did we accomplish in this video? For starters, we now have a working Elasticsearch cluster that will allow us to index documents. We also reviewed Elasticsearch's default node configuration and how that impacts indexing and search performance. The next step that we need to complete in order to build a working search application is to start indexing our data set, and that is exactly what we are going to do in the next video. In the last section, we set up a working Elasticsearch instance. In this video, we will begin adding real data to our index. Over the remaining videos in this section, we will also cover field types, how Elasticsearch classifies a given field, text analysis, how that field is broken down into searchable tokens, routing, how Elasticsearch determines which shard to place the document in, and finally, bulk indexing, or how to batch large lists of updates into a single command. Our next step is to begin ingesting data into our application. You can see here that we have a document defined in JSON. JSON is the format that we use to communicate with Elasticsearch, both for adding new documents, as well as searching via the query DSL. It has a strictly hierarchical structure, along with inherent support for several key field types, strings, numbers, and booleans, in addition to null values. This JSON block describes a single book with fields for information, such as title, authors, publishing date, and ISBN. As a note, I'm using the sense view in Marvel because it gives a slightly better visual representation of the commands as we walk through them. But all these commands also work using curl in the command line or using the URI commands in the browser. To ingest this document, we need to use the put method to add the document to our index. We specify our index name for the project, in this case, library, the document type, which is books, and a document ID of one, since this is the first document that we're ingesting. The document type is essentially a category within the index. For instance, we could have separate types for movies and music within our library index. Each document type can have its own settings for indexing and querying, as we will see in the next video. Let's go ahead and ingest this document. The success message on the right verifies that we added a document to the library index with a type of books. Although we could have created these separately, they were both created automatically based on the path that we provided. You will also notice that the document is assigned a version number, one in this case, because we just indexed a new document. Subsequent updates won't create a new document, so this is the only time that the created flag is true. You will also notice that I have explicitly specified an ID for this document. Usually your ID scheme should correspond to the ID scheme of your primary application or product catalog, for example. If an ID is not specified, Elasticsearch will automatically assign a unique hash to the document ID. Although convenient, this should only be used if a canonical way to identify the data doesn't already exist. If we index this document again, you will notice that the document version number increments accordingly. This is very useful because when updating a document, you can specify the version number that you are expecting to modify. So what happens if we try to update a specific document version that has already been modified by another source? Elasticsearch throws an error, alerting you to the version conflict. Now that we know the basics of ingesting a document, let's verify that a document is in the index by searching for it. We can do that by using the underscore search handler on our library index and specifying a query. Our document is returned just as expected. You can see that the return is also in JSON. It contains our document along with the metadata about the search and the current state of the Elasticsearch cluster. One other thing to note is that within the return for document, the source object allows us to access all of the original field values, which will be extremely useful to us when we build out our application. To recap, all documents are indexed as JSON objects and then stored within an index and a given document type. During this video, we created an index and ingested our first documents into it. In the next video, we will learn more about what Elasticsearch's schemaless structure really means and how to use it as a springboard for defining our field types. In the previous video, we ingested an individual document into our Elasticsearch index, but it is still not clear how Elasticsearch is interpreting that data. The purpose of this video is to begin lifting the curtain on what is happening behind the scenes when we index a document. By definition, Elasticsearch is schemaless, meaning that it seeks to automatically determine the best type for a given document field. In Elasticsearch vocabulary, assigning a type to a field is referred to as mapping. Elasticsearch's default mappings are usually a good starting point, especially for clean data sources.
Let's check to see how Elasticsearch is currently mapping the fields of the document that we indexed. We can do this by going to get slash library slash books underscore mapping. Notice that we have not assigned an explicit schema to the data, but Elasticsearch has already made some assumptions about how to classify each field. So what is going on here? First, Elasticsearch has set up the mappings for our library index. Within that, we have our document type of books. While they both use this keyword of type, document types are not to be confused with field types. A document type is a user-created attribute similar to a category, but by contrast, field types are limited to a few predefined options and determine how a field is indexed and interpreted by Elasticsearch. A mapping is created when the first instance of a field is indexed. If you subsequently try to ingest a field value that isn't or can't be converted to the assigned type, Elasticsearch will throw an error. For instance, now when we try to pass in a value of $9.99 as a string to the number field, we get an error because the string cannot be parsed into a number. But what happens when we try to pass a string containing just a number into the number field? If we remove the dollar sign from the value, Elasticsearch automatically converts this string to a number for us. While useful, this can also be dangerous. If the first price we indexed was recognized as a long, then subsequent decimal points would be disregarded. So what are the possible values for field type? The four primary field types are strings. This is the most used field type for text-based document. String fields hold everything from short fields like author names to long-form content like book chapters. There are multiple ways that Elasticsearch can extract searchable terms from string fields using components called analyzers, which we will cover in the next video. The next type is numbers. The number type is comprised of several subtypes, namely bytes, shorts, integers, longs, floats, and doubles. These correspond in function with the same number types in Java. The date type provides support for a variety of commonly recognized date formats, and the Boolean type is used for storing true-false values. In addition to the four primary field types, Elasticsearch also supports binary files encoded in Base64, geospatial coordinates for shapes or points, IP addresses, and token values. While not technically a field type, Elasticsearch also supports null values. By indexing an example document, we already started to see how Elasticsearch natively interpreted our data. Since our data was limited in scope and well-structured, the automatic type selection was pretty accurate. But what if this isn't the case? Then you will need to override the mappings for specific fields as it makes sense. Note that explicit mappings can only be defined before you index a document that contains the new field. This ensures that only backwards compatible changes can be made to the index. In order to manually assign field types, we'll need to use the Put Mapping API. We're going to use the current mappings as a starting point for our data structure and field specific settings. So let's copy those over and see where we can make improvements. We already made sure that the price field was correctly recognized as a number by not including a dollar sign within the string. However, numbers are the only type of field that can be detected within strings. Looks like our publish date field is being interpreted as a string instead of as a date. Let's go ahead and change that in our mapping settings. First, we'll change the field type to date. Then, in order for the date to be correctly recognized, we're going to use a year-month format. Since we've already ingested this field before, let's delete our current index so that we can start over. Next, we pass in our mappings. And then re-ingest the document. Let's verify our field type mappings again. It looks like all of our fields are now being recognized correctly. One thing to note for later is that it is possible to set the index.mapper.dynamic property for a document type to false, which means that when Elasticsearch comes across any fields that it does not recognize, they will be ignored. If you have a well-defined data structure, this will enforce your specified structure and make sure that any malformed fields are rejected. This concludes our look at field types. In our next video, we will be diving into some more advanced indexing topics that will build on the mapping conventions that we have just seen. Now that we have learned about the basic Elasticsearch field types, let's go over some of the more advanced topics related to ingesting documents with Elasticsearch. If your content isn't indexed correctly, it won't match when you search for it. We combat that by knowing how to store and analyze our data. 
Specifically, we will cover text analyzers, stemming, multi-fields, document routing, and batch ingestion. Text analyzers. Analyzers are used to extract searchable terms, otherwise known as tokens, from the text. Here is an example result of using the standard analyzer. You can see that there are two tokens resulting from this string, example and text. Both tokens have been lowercase. When we use the whitespace analyzer, the terms are split apart but retain their original capitalization. This will make the text harder to search for because the query must match the text as it is indexed. Setting up a field-specific analyzer is easy. We just add it to our field mappings like this. The full list of available analyzers is standard, simple, whitespace, stop, keyword, pattern, language, and snowball. Related to text analysis, stemming is the process of breaking words down to their base root. So for instance, with the right stemmer in place, a search for interpret would also return results for fields matching interpreting and interpretations, among others. Right now our search engine is not using a stemmer. Let's see if this is a problem. Let's see if we can find our book by searching for machines instead of machine. Our book is not returned because Currently, machine and machines do not resolve to the same token. We can fix this by using the English Analyzer. Configuring field-specific text analyzers is done very similarly to how we set up our field types. For instance, in order to normalize Latin-based text, we may want to lowercase the entire string and then split up the terms based on the white space. Separate analyzers can also be configured for interpreting text during ingestion versus at query time. Now our book is returned when we search for machines. Multi-fields. In the last example, we looked at how stemming could help our search terms hit on a broader set of matches. What if we also wanted to keep the original text and boost higher based on that match? That is where multi-fields shine. Multi-fields are useful for ingesting a field several times using different settings. We just add the new field in a fields object and then specify the standard analyzer. We can also add a field specific boost. Document routing. Routing determines how documents are stored in the available shards. By default, routing is based on a hash of the document ID. This means that documents are evenly distributed over all of the shards. The downside of this is that all shards need to be queried in order to return any given document. For most general use cases, this isn't the end of the world. But what if there was a way to distribute the documents by a more logical structure? Our search queries could see a noticeable increase in performance because these scoped queries would only go to an individual shard instead of being broadcast to every shard. There are two primary ways to implement a custom routing scheme. The first way is to determine the route based on the document field. The second routing method is to explicitly pass a routing number with the document. While this is not as convenient as field-based routing, it is useful in cases where a single field isn't a good predictor of how a document should be stored. It is also marginally faster because the hash doesn't have to be parsed. We will stick with the automatic routing strategy for our example application. Batch ingestion. Now that we have worked through some of the kinks in our data structure, it is time to load up a sizable number of documents into our index. We will do this through the bulk API. Here we have a data file containing about 101 technical book titles along with their accompanying metadata. You will notice that every other line is an individual JSON document, and above those documents there is an additional metadata line described in the update method and indexing path. Note that because the line returns are how Elasticsearch delineates between the items, each action and document must be on a single line. And now for the moment of truth. Our Elasticsearch index now contains 101 technical books and their metadata. That wraps up our section on Elasticsearch ingestion. Hopefully you have a better sense of how indexing works, how to override Elasticsearch's default field mappings and settings, as well as a basic understanding of some of the more advanced concepts related to ingestion. Coming up in the next section, we will cover how to use Elasticsearch's powerful query DSL. Now that we have an index containing a representative set of data for our project, it is time to learn how to effectively query Elasticsearch. In this section, we will learn about several types of searches, including 
simple searches, filters, which return documents without scoring them for faster performance, and compound queries. In this video, we are going to take a deeper look at the structure of query objects, as well as learning about the basic types of queries, how they work, and when you might want to implement one over the other. We will primarily be looking at what is unique about each type, as opposed to going into minute detail about their individual properties. While we won't use every type in our final application, it is important to understand the types of queries that are available in Elasticsearch. The primary way of interacting with Elasticsearch from a client-side application is through its query DSL, or domain-specific language. In the case of Elasticsearch, this is a robust JSON API endpoint. One of the benefits of the query DSL is that it allows us to represent a query as a JSON object, rather than having to pass in each parameter in one long concatenated string. This means that the query itself is much cleaner, making it easier to create and understand. The query DSL shines once we start getting into some of the more advanced queries that Elasticsearch supports. Compared to the standard format, passing an object to the query DSL is well structured. You can see that it is much cleaner and more readable, especially once the requests become more complex. Elasticsearch also maintains many useful language-specific clients that are written for languages ranging from Java to Go. If JavaScript isn't your preferred stack, you should definitely check them out. The Elasticsearch API defines several key kinds of text matching queries, including term, match, fuzzy, more like this, and common terms. Terms. A term query is used for direct text matching. There is a separate query type for a single term versus multi-terms, which allows you to pass in an array of terms. The main thing to understand about term queries is that no analysis is done on the query string, and it will only return any documents from an index that are identical matches of the given terms. For instance, if you search for an uppercase title that was indexed as lowercase, it will not be returned. The match query type is a good general purpose query because it uses the same analyzing chain as the field that is being searched. This fixes the problem that we saw with the terms query where a search keyword would not return any documents because the two strings were not interpreted the same way, resulting in a mismatch. Keep in mind that this is not the case when no specific field is being targeted by the match query. Match queries can be used to find numbers, dates, and strings, among others. Match query interprets each keyword in the query string as an array of terms joined by Boolean logic. Unless specified otherwise, a search for blue dress will be interpreted as blue or dress. In other words, the query type defaults to or. Of course, you can either change this to end or increase the minimum match setting to require more words from the query string to match a given document. Multi-match query type goes one step further to allow you to define multiple fields to search over. In addition to the regular match functionality, there are also variants for matching phrases and prefixes. These can be written as either the root query type or as a node within the main match object. Phrase matches, the keywords must occur next to each other rather than separately within the same document. How far apart the words can be and still be considered a phrase is called the slop setting. A slop of one means that the words can occur up to one word away from each other. Elasticsearch also has a number of span query types that provide more control of their slop parameters. Finally, prefix matches allow us to match documents that start with the query keywords. This is useful for generating results before the full string has been entered, as in the case of autocomplete. In order to match the start of a phrase, use the match phrase prefix. Range queries can be used to return documents that fall within a span of accepted matches. Numbers are the most common example. Ranges can also work with dates. Ranges accept greater than, greater than equals, less than, and less than than equals. For instance, we could find all of the books that have been published in the last five years. We could also have a search that only returned books published between 2010 and 2012.
filters. Unlike full queries, filters do not assign a score to the return documents, so they can be extremely fast and computationally efficient to return. Because filters are binary, either a document is within the set or it isn't, they can be great for narrowing down a result set before running a more complex query. Here we are combining a normal query with a filter using the filtered query. In addition, filters are also heavily cached so that other queries can take advantage of them without performance overhead. Filters can be used to check if a document exists or is missing, whether it has parents and or children, what type it is, and whether one of its fields falls within a geographic shape, among others. Filters can also contain subqueries. As you can see, filters are a very robust and good choice if you are looking to create an unranked list of documents. Once you have used filters to generate a subset of documents, you can use another query to score each document. In short, if you don't need to rank documents by score, always use a filter query because of its inherent speed. In this video, we've covered a number of different types of queries and some of the basic uses for them. Hopefully now you have a general understanding of some of the different benefits of each and an idea of when to use one type over another. In the next video, we are going to learn about some more specific query types. In addition to the core query types, there are also several specialty queries with very specific uses. Let's briefly go over those so that we can add them to our toolkit. Fuzzy queries look for terms that are similar to the provided text, but are several deviations away from the original. This can be useful for name search, where misspelling a name is quite common. Complete matches will still be scored higher, meaning that those documents will rise to the top. This can be very useful functionality, but keep in mind that it is also very computationally heavy, so don't use it without reason. The more like this query takes either a string of text or an example field and returns documents that are similar. This is useful for passing in a larger chunk of text, such as a book description. It can also be used to suggest similar documents as you might expect to see in a related article section. You can also combine the more like this functionality with fuzzy logic by using the fuzzy like this or fuzzy like this field queries. A common query groups the query keywords into two categories, low frequency and high frequency. The assumption is that because high frequency words, such as end or about, aren't unique, they should factor into the return document score much less than the more valuable low frequency words. Other search engines like Solar have fixed this problem in the past by using stop words, or lists of words, that were entirely dropped by the query parser. Although Elasticsearch also used to use stop words, the common terms query type is a much more flexible solution to this underlying problem because it automatically adapts to the words in the current index and allows you to set a threshold called the cutoff frequency for what the low and high values should be. The IDs query looks up a specific document or documents in the index by their IDs. This can be useful if you need to return a known document for a detail view, for instance. Prefix searches match values beginning with the query string. Searching for partial keywords is very important for scenarios like autocomplete requests, as we will see in a later section. A wildcard search returns items that match on incomplete strings. Use a question mark to indicate single missing characters and an asterisk to denote any number of additional characters. As you can see, a search for Java star will return results for Java as well as JavaScript. As you would expect, regex queries allow you to match documents based on a given regex pattern. Keep in mind that complex patterns will use more computation resources, so keep them simple. You might also consider using filters to narrow down the document set to a much smaller starting point before using a regex query. The query string query type gives you access to the underlying Lucene query parser. This may be useful if you are already using Lucene queries, maybe you just switched from Solar, or need to access the more complex and robust Lucene syntax.
While this is useful to developers and technical audiences, it is often better to expose a simpler handler to end users so that the complex logic is masked behind the scenes. The final two specialty query types have to do with how documents are scored. DISMAX uses the highest scoring subquery or field for a given document rather than adding the scores together. And lastly, Constant Score takes the enclosed query and sets the same score for each document that is returned. It can also be used with filters. That concludes our look at some of the more advanced query types in Elasticsearch. Next up, we will go over a few examples of how to effectively combine queries together in order to take advantage of the multiple query types within a parent query. In the last two sections, we introduced some of the basic query types that we can use as building blocks to create more complex searches. By combining these into compound queries, we can control the score and results from each subquery. Let's take a look at some of the things that we can do with compound queries. If we wanted to find all of the books that match Drupal, but none of the books that contain Flash, we could use a Boolean query in order to chain together two separate terms queries within one Boolean query. In this case, we define that Drupal must match and Flash must not match. The other logic switch that is available for Boolean queries is the should match, which means that documents that match the given query are scored higher but are not required to match to be included in the final result set. But what if we still wanted to return documents that contain the term flash, but score them lower than the ones that didn't? This is where the boosting query comes in. You will notice that instead of adding a positive boost to the primary query, we are actually giving a negative boost to the query that we want to feature less prominently in the results. As our searches become more and more complex, it becomes easier to form incorrect search objects. In order to combat this, Elasticsearch has a useful validation API that you can reach by going to underscore validate slash query and passing in any query just like you would with the underscore search endpoint. This wraps up our look into the Elasticsearch DSL. In this section, we learned about the types of queries that are available to us in Elasticsearch and how to construct them. We have also seen how some of them will be useful to us in developing our application. Queries are very specific to your data, so hopefully you now have a better understanding of what their individual strengths are and when you would use them. In the next section, we will begin to apply our new Elasticsearch knowledge to building out a working JavaScript search interface. Up to this point, we have looked in depth at Elasticsearch and what it is capable of. Now it is time to zoom out and start building our search application. In this section, we flesh out the basic functionality of our application, adding search inputs, results, pagination, sort controls, and aggregations. To begin, we have a general project structure. First, we are including the actual Angular JavaScript files. We have also included an Elasticsearch connector specifically for Angular, which is a module that Elasticsearch provides, giving us an easy way to interact with their API for searching, indexing, etc. Next up, we have a CSS file for our project. These specific styles are outside the scope of this video, so we will leave this as is and focus on building out our actual markup and functionality. That's it for prepackaged code. The search app.js file is where our custom JavaScript application will live. Then finally, we have search.html. Opening it up, you can see that it is just a normal HTML5 boilerplate file. Looking further inside of our header, we are calling a few JavaScript files. We've linked to AngularJS, the Elasticsearch client, and our own search app. Now, the first thing that we need to do is to tell Angular which area of the page we want it to control. ng-app, which tells Angular what our root element is. Then we will specify our app name, which will be search app. This will correspond with the application name that we are about to create. Switching to the search app.js file, we create a variable called search app, like we just specified in our HTML. This is an Angular module, 
and then we need to include that name again and in the dependencies of that application. In this case, our one dependency is Elasticsearch. We now have our application shell, and we are including it on the page. There is not much to see now in the browser, but if you look under the hood, we can see the elements that we've created. So let's add some data that we can display in the UI. In order to do that, we need to create a controller to manage a section of our application. We add a search app dot controller. Controllers have the concept of dollar sign scope. To show a simple message, we are going to define scope dot hello within the controller and set it equal to hello world. Then in our application, we need to make sure that we reference the correct controller, which we do by ng-controller. You should recognize by now that all of the Angular attributes are prefixed by ng- Since we are already within the scope of the search results controller, we should be able to add a template tag of curly bracket, curly bracket, hello. Hello being the variable that we just created. Great, our hello world text is showing up. In the next video, we will walk through getting results from Elasticsearch and displaying them in the browser. We're going to start by building an HTML template for our results and search fields. To begin, we add a div and give it a class of search form. This will be our wrapper for our inputs. Next, we create a form element and we're going to add a special ng submit action of search. This will map to our controller's search function that we're going to be building in a moment. Inside of that, we're going to add two inputs. The first is the search box, and we give that a placeholder of search for books. The second input will be our submit button, and we give that a value of search. Moving down the page, we need to create our results list. So we start by adding a section called results. At the top of that, we add a search title so that we can show what people have searched for. Then we add a list. In our list item tag, we're going to add a special ng-repeat attribute, which is an Angular function that allows us to iterate over an array of elements. In our case, we want to iterate over each book in our results.documents array. The variable book here could be anything, but book makes most semantic sense in our case. It's simply the iterator for our position within the array. Now inside of that, we need to add our actual book information. So we add a heading, and we're going to add a template tag of book.title. This will output the title for each element in our array. Then secondly, we're going to add the detailed description. The syntax for this is a little bit different because of the space in the field name. This gives us our basic HTML structure. Now that we have our basic template in place, let's start fleshing out our application. First, we're going to create a results object, and then within that, a documents array. We want our documents array to be populated by results from Elasticsearch. Let's verify that our template works by adding in one example document just to see how things will show up. Switching to the browser, it looks like everything is working correctly, and we can now see our one result. We'll go back to a blank array and start building the functionality to really search. First, we're going to call a search service dot search function. We'll be building this out in a minute, but I wanted to show how everything will fit together and how we're going to be using this within our controller. Once the search is executed, the function will asynchronously return the results to the controller where we can then set them equal to our array at scope.results.document. Next, we add our search service. So we create searchapp.service and then give it a name of search service. We then need to supply the module dependencies of the service. 
In our case, these dependencies are $Q, which is Angular's implementation of promises, and ESFactory, which is the Elasticsearch client from Elasticsearch. We define them once as strings and then pass them into the function itself so that they aren't mangled by any build processes. Within our service, we're going to create an ES client variable that will map to an instance of the Elasticsearch factory. We configure it by adding a location of localhost port 9200, which is where our Elasticsearch instance is running. Next, we create our search function. Our function needs to have the idea of promises, which will allow us to take the return from Elasticsearch and pass it back to our original function in the controller. In order to do that, we set up a deferred variable that maps to the dollar sign Q. Then at the end of our function, we return deferred.promise, which sends a placeholder back to the originating function. Now in the main body of our search function, we need to actually make our search request. So we call esclient.search, which allows us to use the Elasticsearch query DSL, like we've seen in previous sections. Within the main search body, we specify that we're going to search over the library index. Then we're going to use a match all query, which by default will return the first 10 documents in the index. Because the ES Factory library also uses promises, we can then call a function after the results are successfully returned. It accepts two functions, one on success and one on error. The success function returns the documents, while the error function returns an error and its message. So we're going to take the Elasticsearch return and resolve our promise that we set up within our search function. So we call deferred.resolve and pass in the return. On the other hand, if an error comes back from Elasticsearch, we reject our promise and pass back that error. Now all the basic functionality of our search function is set up. Now we need to add our search service as a dependency of our main controller, just like we've done previously. Let's switch back to the browser and see what happens. Let's log our ES return just to see what its structure is. Opening up the return, we can see that it's an object that contains a hits object, which contains one further hits array. The hits array is what we're really interested in, specifically the source element within each object. What we really want is an array of just these source fields for each object. So in our application, we're going to reformat them to a format that our template expects. We'll do that by calling search service dot format results. Then we'll create the function. This function needs to accept our documents as a parameter. Within the format results function, we're going to create a temporary array called formatted results. Then we loop over the documents array with a for each function. The document parameter is the individual item in the array. So for each document, we're going to push its underscore source object to our formatted results array. Then we want to return the formatted results. So now our scope.results.documents should be equal to our formatted results. Let's try again. It looks like we're getting an error because we're trying to loop over an object instead of an array. That's because what we actually want to format is esreturn.hits.hits. Okay, let's try this again. Great. We are now returning 10 results from Elasticsearch and showing them in our UI. In the next section, we'll be hooking up our search input to be able to search for specific keywords within our documents. We'll also cover setting state and how to load in more results. When we wrapped up the last video, we had created a search template which was controlled by a search controller that knew how to get results with our search service. One key thing that we are missing is the ability to search for specific keywords with our application. 
in order to start adding that functionality, we add an ng-model to our search input, and we assign it to search terms. And this will map to scope.searchTerms. Now back in our controller, we create scope.searchTerms and set it to null initially, since it won't have a value when people first come to the page. Our controller searches when it initializes. We want to change that so that it's a specific function that we can call within our application. So we create a get results function. We also want to create a search function. The search function is called whenever our form is submitted. Inside of the search function, we create a variable for search terms, which is just shorthand for scope.searchTerms. Then we check to make sure that search terms exists and is not null. And if so, we set it equal to scope.results.searchTerms. Then finally, we call our getResults function to load in results. If search terms do not exist, we don't want anything to happen. So we just return in that situation. In our scope.results object, we add a search terms element so that we can set it when we make a search. Keeping the results.search terms separate from the value of our input allows us to use results.search terms as a title for our search. Because scope.search terms is bound to our input, it changes whenever the input value does. So now we have the notion of search terms, but we're not actually passing them to our search function. Let's remedy that. Inside of our getResults function, we pass in scope.results.searchTerms as a parameter. Then we set up our function to accept that parameter in our search service. Instead of matching every document in our index, we use the match query to search over the title field for our keywords. Let's try it out. Elasticsearch is now returning documents that contain our keywords within the title. Right now we're only matching if a keyword is found within the title. But if we use the underscore all field, we can return documents based on their description, etc. To illustrate this, if we search for turbo gears, you can see that it's only contained in the description. In our get results function, when a search is returned successfully, we set those results equal to our results.documents. But what happens when an error is returned instead? We need to add a second function to handle that scenario and pass in an error. Then we'll log that to the console. In order to generate an error, we'll temporarily send a bad query to Elasticsearch. When we reload the page and search for book, we get an error back from Elasticsearch, and the detailed message is printed out in our console. Now that we know that it works, we can put our search query back to normal. So now we're returning results based on our keywords, but it would be useful to know how many results there are total that match a query within our Elasticsearch instance. In our scope.results object, we create a new element called document count, and we set it to null. Next, in our getResults function, once a search has been successfully returned, we create a variable called total hits and map it to esreturn.hits.total. We'll check to make sure that that value is greater than zero. And then we'll set our scope.results.document account to that variable. In the case that no results were returned, we want to set a new state element for application. In this case, scope.noResults should be true. And we'll add the new scope element to our controller. We now have a few different state items and they should be reset whenever we execute a full search. So we'll call reset results at the top of our search function. 
Then we'll create the reset results function and use it to reset. Are no results, results.documents, and result.documentCount to their initial values. Since our search terms are set as part of the search function, we don't need to reset those. So we've now added the document count. Our controller knows what the document count is, but we haven't added it to our template yet. Switching to our HTML document, we add a title for our search terms. And we also add our document count. And now both show up in our application. We'll also add a special message if no results were returned. Because we're talking to a local instance of Elasticsearch, our results are nearly instantaneous. But we also need to handle when results take a little bit longer by adding an is searching state. We set is searching to false initially. And then when our get results function executes, we set it to true. Once results are returned, we set it to false. And the same thing for when an error is returned. In order to indicate to the user that we are searching, we add a spinner element to our template. We only want it to show up if we're actually searching. So we use ng if and set it to is searching. Next, we use set timeout to create some fake lag just to make sure that it works. Now we have a nice animation while our results are loading. We'll remove the timeout from our application. The next thing our application needs is to be able to load in more results. So we'll be adding a button to load more in. In order to do that, we create scope.results page and set it equal to zero. We also want to add it to our results reset, so we add it there as well. We also need to create a new function called getNextPage. Inside of our function, we need to do two things. First, we need to increment our scope.results page property. And then we need to call get results. Since we want to use the last search terms and we don't want to reset our results, we don't need to call search. Calling get results will load in more results without resetting our application or changing our search terms. It looks like we need to add a button to our page. So in our template, We'll add a button with a class of load next, and then give it a title. It also needs a click action to call our get next page function. Now our button shows up, but it shows up even if there aren't any results, or if all the results have been loaded. We want it to only show up when there are actually more results to be retrieved. So on our button element, we add an ng if attribute and set it to can get next page. Now in our controller, we're going to create a special watch group. A watch group will allow us to observe multiple state properties and return a value whenever they are changed. In our case, we want the value to update anytime results, no results, or is searching is changed. We create a document count variable as an easy way to access scope.results.documentCount. Then we create an if statement where we're going to test if it doesn't exist or if it's less than or equal to our results.documents.length. We also want to catch if there are no results or if we're currently searching. If any of those things are true, scope that can get next page should be false. Otherwise, there are more results to get and we can currently load them. 
we've also left off passing our results page property to our search function. So we'll add it to our get results function, as well as to our search function within our search service. Within our Elasticsearch query, we add a from property, and we set it equal to our results page times the number of results that are returned, which in our case is the default of 10. Now when we reload our application, the load more results button does not show up until we make a search where there are actually more results to be retrieved. However, it looks like there's still one issue, and that is that when we get the next results, they are replacing our original documents. To fix that, we're going to use push.apply to add our new results to the original results.documents. Now when we run a search, we can get more results, and our Get Next Results button only shows up when it should. Our core functionality is now in place, so in the next section we can begin adding filters and autocomplete, among others. Our application is taking shape, and we have a basic results view. Now we can add some bells and whistles. We'll start off by adding highlighted snippets to our results to show the matching keywords. Then we'll add the ability to change the field our results are sorted by, and wrap up by grouping our results into aggregations. Highlights provide users with valuable context and can give them the information that they need to further refine their results or reaffirm their selection. In other words, showing users why the search results have been returned is an important part of search. One of the ways that we can do this is to highlight words that match their provided query. Implementing highlights in Elasticsearch is fairly straightforward. First, we create a highlight object, and then we add title and detailed description as fields within that object. We will further set the number of fragments for those highlights to zero, meaning that the full field will be returned. This works for our needs because our fields are relatively small, but for a field with larger values, you should return a subset of that field in most cases. Looking at the response from Elasticsearch, we can see that an additional highlight object is now returned with the results. The highlight object contains the highlights of the fields for this document. In order to match these highlights with our search results, we add a function inside of our format results function that tests for any field names that have a corresponding node in the highlights object. We will use the angular for each function to loop over each field in our document source object. The for each function passes the value and the field, which is the object key, into our function. If they do exist, then we replace the document dot underscore source value with the highlight for that field. You will also notice that in a case where the highlight object doesn't exist in the Elasticsearch result, we set it to an empty object. This makes sure that the function doesn't error out when we attempt to look for a highlighted field within it. If the highlight array does exist, then the function proceeds as normal. Then we replace the source field with its highlight. One major difference between the original fields and the new highlighted fields is that the highlights contain HTML that needs to be rendered in the page. For instance, by default, each individual highlight is enclosed inside of an M tag that will need to be displayed as HTML to be useful. However, Angular does not allow us to directly insert HTML values into the application for security reasons. So we first need to include the ng sanitize JavaScript module and then make that available to our application. Once the sanitize module is hooked up, we can then bind the highlight HTML to our search results using the ng-bind-html attribute inside of our search template. You can see now that on our results page the matching terms are highlighted, which allows us to quickly get an overview of the relevant text. 
and this wraps up adding highlights to our search application. In the next video, we will add the capability to sort our search results based on either relevancy or price. Now that we are including results and highlights, we can add sort controls. We'll add a section where we can have our sidebar and we'll give it a class of filters. We only want it to show up if we actually have a search. So we use ngif and set it to results.searchterms. Then we add a heading for our sort function. For the sorting function, the first thing that we will need to do is to add a select element to our HTML page. We set the ng-model to sort. We're going to have an array of sort options and the selected sort will be the current option. ng-option controls the options that are shown. The ng-options attribute controls the options that are shown. We select option.displayName for this individual option in the sort options, which is our object array. When the select element changes, we'll call update sort using the ng change method. Since we will be able to sort by price, it will be useful to have that show up in the UI. So we'll go ahead and add the price underscore GBP to our template. Then switching back to our application code, we will create our sort function within scope. This all might seem a bit confusing, but let's set it up in the JavaScript and walk through each step as we do. First, we create our scope.sort options, which is an array of objects. The two fields that we want to allow our users to sort on are underscore score and price underscore GBP. Each sort object has a display name and a direction to be sorted. Score will be sorted in descending order and price will be sorted by ascending. Next, we create our selected sort variable and set it to the first option in the array, which is score. Now we need a function to catch when the user changes this sort. We create a scope.changeSort function, which will need to do two things. One, it needs to reset the results, which will remove our current results and reset our application state. And two, it needs to use the search terms from the previous query. The last thing that we need to do is to make sure that our search service has the concept of sort, so we will add that as a variable in our function. When querying with a specific sort, Elasticsearch expects a slightly different format than what we have in our Angular application. We can get around that by adding a sort object and setting the sort.name and the sort of direction in that object. Then we pass all of that to our sort array within the Elasticsearch search parameters. Looking in the browser, we make sure that everything is working. When we run a search, it is ranked by relevancy by default. Now when we switch the select element to price, you can see that the results are returned by price in ascending order. Going back to our HTML, to summarize again what is happening, we added a model for the selected sort option, and then we told Angular that the options for the selected element were within the sort options array. For each option, within that, we used the option.displayName as the individual option element. In the next video, we will cover adding filters, which will allow users to narrow down the results using aggregations. In Elasticsearch, field values can be grouped together using aggregations. Our book catalog would be much easier to navigate if after we entered in some keywords, we could narrow down to only titles that dealt with a specific topic, such as web design. In order to add filters to our search application, we need to first format the aggregations that Elasticsearch returns, similar to what we did with our main results. In order to return aggregations from Elasticsearch, we first add 
an AGS object to our query structure, and then within that, we create a topics aggregation. In this case, topics could be any name that we wanted to give our aggregation. It's not specific to anything. Next, we tell Elasticsearch that we want to aggregate by the terms in our topics field. Then we switch to the browser to confirm that it's working. We do a search for Django, and then pulling up our network tab, we can look in our search return and see the new aggregations object. In order to display these aggregations in our application, we're going to create a new service for filters. Within our filter service, we set up an object for filters that has two sub-elements, available filters and selected filters. The available filters are all of the filters that Elasticsearch returns while the selected filters are only the currently active ones. Similarly to what we did in the primary results, we also need to set up a format filters function. This function should take a parameter for the aggregations that we're going to pass in from Elasticsearch. Within this function, we map this to self as an easy reference, and then create a temporary variable called formatted filters which will be our temporary filters object. It will be returned at the end of the function. We loop through each key in the aggregations object, and then test to make sure that that key has its own property. So in this instance, our aggregation is our topics aggregation. We only have one that we're gonna be looping through, but we wanna make sure that this code will work when there are multiple aggregations. Now within this aggregation, we want to loop over the individual filters and map them to our object structure. We create a variable called filters that maps the aggregation.buckets array to our intended format. We need to pass the individual object to the function, which will be an individual filter. One piece of information that we want to add to our filter state is whether or not it's selected. So we create a variable is selected and map it to a function. Within the is selected function, we return a new function, which is self.findSelectedFilter. We'll be creating this function in a second. The two items that we need to pass to the findSelectedFilter function are the name of the aggregation, which in this case is topics, and the object key, which is the value of the current filter. If our function returns negative one, we set is selected to false otherwise true. At the end of our filters map function, we return our new object. The value of the filter is the object.key. Its count is the object.doc underscore count. And is selected is result of our is selected function. Then at the end of the for loop, we map our aggregation to our newly formatted filters. In our code, we've used the find selected filter function, but we haven't created it yet. So let's go ahead and do that. As we saw before, this function needs to accept a field name and its value in order to test if it's already selected. We create a for loop to loop over our selected filters array. This is a pretty standard JavaScript function i as an iterator, set it to zero, make sure that it's less than our selected filters dot length, and then iterate that variable. We create an object variable that's equal to the current iterator in the selected filters. Then we test if that object dot field equals our field and its object dot value equals our provided value. If so, we return its position. Otherwise, we return negative one. Like we've done before, we need to add our filter service as a module in our main controller. And then once the results come back, 
we call our filter service and format our filters, passing in the esreturn.aggregations. Let's log our filters to the console just to make sure everything is working. We now have an array of filters, but it looks like some of these are single terms that should actually be together. For instance, open source should be one value rather than being separated. This is because our field in Elasticsearch is tokenized. So let's go ahead and fix that in our mappings. First, we'll get our existing mappings, and we can see that our topics field is a string, but we don't want that to be analyzed. So let's copy over our mappings so that we can change that. As we've done before, we'll use the put command to add these mappings to our library index. But first, we need to delete our existing index, so we delete the library. Now let's make our changes to the topics field. We'll create a new subfield called full, which won't be tokenized. It also has a type of string, but we're going to index it as not analyzed. Now we'll actually add those mappings to our index, and we can see that it is acknowledged as true, and we'll repost all of our documents to the bulk API. Since we created a new subfield, we need to update our application. So we'll be using the topics.full field for our aggregations. Now when our aggregation values come back, you can see that they make more sense. So we have all books and open source as two kinds of topics. So this is now working as it should. But now we need to add these filters to our template. In the sidebar section of our template, we'll add a new heading called Refined By, and then beneath it, a div with the class of Filter Group. Within the Filter Group tag, we're going to add an ng-repeat attribute, which will allow this filter to be repeated for each type of aggregation. We only have one, but again, we're doing this for extensibility in the future. Within our ng-repeat attribute, we're going to split out our filter and its filter array. Both of those can be found in the filters.availableFilters object. Next, we'll create a title for this filter group and then add a list for the individual filter values. On the element list item, we're again going to use entry repeat. This time, we're going to loop over each object in our filter array, which is the array of individual values. Then, we're going to insert a pipe character, and after that, we're going to use a special sorting function to order the results by whether or not they're selected. And to display the value itself, we add a link and map its class name to whether or not the object is selected. This allows us to bold the objects that are currently selected. And the link's text is going to be our object.value. Next to each link, we're going to add the object.count, which is how many documents match the current filter. Now our filter service contains the state of the active filters, but we can't access it directly from our template. So we're going to map scope.filters to our filter service.filter. Let's try it out. Our filters are now showing up in our sidebar, but there is currently no way for us to select them. So we need to add an ng click action. to our filter links, and within that we'll call toggle filter, passing in the filter name and our individual filter object's value. Since we need to expose this function to our template, we'll add toggle filter as a function within our controller scope. It should allow for two parameters, the field and its value. Within the toggle filter function, we first set up a few variables, selected filters, 
maps to our filter service, that filters, that selected filters. The filter index is the filter service. The filter index is a return from the filter service dot find selected filter function, and we pass in our field and value. And this filter is an object with our field and its value. Then for the main functionality of this function, we test if our filter index is greater than negative one, which would mean that it is already selected. If that's the case, then we splice selected filters, passing in our filter index. If the filter index is negative one, meaning that it's not selected, then we push our this filter object to selected filters. Because we're toggling a filter, we then call reset results and get results to update our results. To test if this is working, we log our filter service dot filters dot selected filters. Now you can see that all books is selected. So our application state is now correctly showing whether or not a filter is selected, but we're not passing that back to Elasticsearch yet. So within our get results function, we also pass in filter service dot filters dot selected filters to our search service dot search. And we add that as a parameter in our search function. Now, because our search query is going to become more complex, since we now have terms and or filters, we're going to create a new set query function and pass in our search terms and the selected filters. Now, inside of our search service, we create a set query function which accepts the two parameters that we just set up. Now, our query variable is going to be the same as our old query. So we'll paste that back in. Our selected filters maps to the filter service dot filters dot selected filters. Our filtered query object uses the JSON structure for a filtered search using Elasticsearch's ESL. Within it, we can combine both our query and our filters. Our filters are going to use Boolean logic and any selected filter must match. So that gives us our basic query structure. Now we need to add some logic to determine which to return and how to format it. If the array of selected filters has a length that's greater than zero, meaning that there are selected filters, we loop through each of the selected filters with a function that accepts the individual filter and its key. We set up a temporary object that maps to a basic terms query, and then within that term object, we map our filter's field name to the filter's value. Finally, we push this query object to our filtered query within filtered.filter.bool.must, which means that any selected filters must match. Now we have two types of queries, normal and filtered queries. Each one has a slightly different query structure and we pass one or the other into Elasticsearch's query DSL, depending on if it's used. At the end of our set query function, we test if the selected filters.length is greater than zero, and if it is, we pass back the filtered query. Otherwise, we just pass back the smaller query object. Our search service now also needs to be able to access the filter service. It looks like it's not working because we're passing in the name of our aggregations, which is topics, rather than the name of our field, which is topics.full. 
So we'll go ahead and replace that. And that should resolve the issue. Now our topics filters are working. Once we've selected a filter, when we search again, the filters are not reset. The last thing that we need to do is that in our search function, we're going to set scope.filters.selectedFilters to an empty array. This means that whenever we execute a new search, there will be no selected filters. Now we can both search and search with selected aggregations. This wraps up this section. In this section, we've covered adding results, sorting, and aggregation. There's one more remaining piece of functionality that we're going to build out in the next section, and that is autocomplete. In the last section of the course, we added more functionality to our search application by implementing highlights, sorting, and aggregations. The last feature that we will be adding in this section is autocomplete. Our autocomplete component will display multi-word suggestions for the search terms in the search box, as well as previewing the results from those suggested words so that users can jump directly to a given book before they have even executed a full search. Being able to show users relevant results even before they have finished typing in their query reassures them that our application has the content that they need. It also allows users to navigate to the content quicker because they don't have to be redirected to a full search page first. The first Elasticsearch component that we're going to be looking into for our autocomplete setup is the term suggester. The term suggester looks at the terms in the provided query and returns alternatives for each term. For instance, if we search for a word that is not in our index, in this case, pearl, like the kind found in the ocean, the top suggestion that Elasticsearch returns is pearl, the programming language, a much more suitable keyword. Let's take a second to look at the syntax. First, we have our suggest object, and within that, we specify a name for our suggestions. We call it autocomplete, but it could be any arbitrary name. Inside of our group name, we have specified the text that Elasticsearch should use as the basis for its suggestions, and then which field should be used to generate the returned values. In this case, we're using the title.basic field. If we input additional words, such as Drupal website with Drupal misspelled, now the options returned from the suggester include separate objects for each term. But looking at our misspelled term Drupal autocomplete suggests Drupal, no options are returned for website because that term exists in our database. Whether or not a suggestion is returned can be controlled by the suggest underscore mode setting. The available modes include always, which returns any available suggestions, Popular, which returns only words that are more frequent than the term provided, and Missing, which only returns a suggestion if the original term doesn't have any matches in the given field. For the purposes of our search engine, we are more concerned with how often a word occurs, so we will go with Popular. So far, we've been looking at individual terms. The term suggester gave us the tools to suggest alternate terms if an individual word is misspelled or incomplete. What happens if we need to check a longer string containing multiple terms? In that situation, we might want to use the phrase suggester. The phrase suggester has some additional settings, such as the prefix length. By setting it to two, this means that the first two characters in the input have to match for a suggestion to be returned. So if we search for Django, it will return Django, but not if we type an R instead of a D at the beginning of the word. Using a prefix length of two or more speeds up the analysis process and won't really affect our application because misspellings are more likely to happen in the middle or end of a word. Another setting that we're using is the main word length, which means that each term has to be more than three characters in order for it to be evaluated by the suggester. Now that we have a query that will allow us to return suggestions, we can implement it into our search application. We'll do that in the next video. In the last video, we saw how to return autocomplete suggestions from Elasticsearch, but we haven't implemented them into our application yet. Let's get started on that. The first thing we're going to do is create a scope.autocomplete object that will contain an array 
of suggestions. We also want to add a state item called show autocomplete, which will allow us to ensure that the suggestions only show up when they should. We'll set it to false initially. So we're going to create scope.evaluateTerms. This function will pass in an event parameter. We create an input terms variable, which is going to be an expression. If scope.searchTerms exist, we set input terms equal to scope.searchTerms to lowercase. If scope.searchTerms does not exist, then input terms is null. Because we don't want to evaluate terms, if somebody presses the return key, we're going to check for event.keycode equals 13, which is the key code for return. If that's true, we want our function to return. Next, we'll check that input terms exists and that it has a length greater than three, meaning that there are at least three characters in our input. If that's true, then we pass them to a get suggestions function. Otherwise, we test to see if input terms does not exist, and in that case, we reset scope.autocomplete. It looks like we have an inconsistency with our naming patterns. Since autocomplete is one word, we don't actually need to capitalize it. Now that that's fixed, we'll set scope show autocomplete to false. Similarly to how we created our get results function, we're going to create a get suggestions function. This function should accept a query, and then within it, we're going to call our search service and a new get suggestions function. We'll pass in a query, and then once the results come back, we'll map the es underscore return dot suggest dot phrase suggestion to our suggestions variable. You can see that same structure in Elasticsearch's return that we saw in the last video. Next, we test to make sure that there actually were suggestions returned. And then we set scope to autocomplete suggestions to those suggestions. If not, we're going to reset the suggestions array. One more thing we need to set is whether or not the autocomplete should be shown. We'll test again to make sure that suggestions.length is greater than zero, and then we will show the autocomplete box. Otherwise, we're going to hide it. There's a little bit of repetition here because we're going to be adding other elements in the next video. Now we're going to go into our search service and copy our search function. We're going to use this as the basis for our get suggestions function. First we rename it, and then we're going to remove a lot of the parameters, since ours should only accept query. We don't need the sort objects, and we're going to remove the body of the request. So what we're left with is the basic promises implementation. Next, we'll copy in the suggest object that we created in the last video. We'll replace the text with our actual query parameter. Once the results are returned, they'll be passed back to our original get suggestions function. Okay, now that we have our functions in place, let's implement a few things in the template. First, we create an ng keyup event, and within it, we'll call our evaluate terms function, passing in the dollar sign event, which is a special Angular event. Next, we'll create a list with a class of suggestions, and we'll make sure that it's only shown when show autocomplete is true. Within our list item, we use ng repeat to loop through each suggestion in the autocomplete.suggestions array. We only want the individual list items to show up if there's an option within suggestion.options. So we'll check the length of that array. 
We'll add some text for our suggestion. So we specify search for, and then we're going to add our actual suggestion text, which is in suggestion.options. And we're going to grab the first option within that array and then use its text as our suggestion. Once again, we need to unify what we're calling show autocomplete. So autocomplete should be all one word, and we'll just capitalize the A. And we want to make sure that we are always using scope that show autocomplete. When we search for Perl, the correct suggestion is returned, as well as for Django. Now we have suggestions showing up in our application. When we click on them, nothing happens. So let's go back to our application code and create a function called search for suggestion. And what this function is going to do is we want to set scope dot search terms to our actual suggestion, which is scope dot autocomplete dot suggestions. And then we're using the first suggestion item and the first item within its options array. Then we need to call scope.search. In our template, we're going to use ng mouse down, call our search for suggestion function. Now we can replace our search terms with the suggestion, but when we click out of the search box, the suggestions are still visible. So we're going to use so on our text box, we're going to use ng-blur, which will be triggered any time focus leaves the text box. And then within that, we're going to set show autocomplete to false. We also want to set show autocomplete to false after we've searched for a suggestion. Let's try it again. Awesome, it looks like our suggestions are working. Wouldn't it be cool if we could suggest relevant book titles even before our user has finished typing? We'll look at one way to add results to our autocomplete in the next video. Now that we have keyword suggestions in place, the final piece of the autocomplete puzzle is showing real-time results even if a user has not finished typing. This can be a tricky scenario. We already have a query that checks for suggestions when the search input is updated. What if we added a regular query to that request as well? In order to return results from Elasticsearch that include all of the terms in our input, even the partial ones, we need to set up a special query. To construct the query itself, we need to first deconstruct the terms in our search box so that we can separate out the last term. To do this, we create a terms variable by splitting the query based on white space. Next, we create a base terms variable which is going to be an expression that tests to make sure that terms.length is at least one. If there's only one term in the input, we don't have any base terms, so we'll set it equal to an empty string. Otherwise, we'll set it equal to our terms minus the last term, and then we will turn them back into a string using the join function and append an empty space at the end of the string. So that's our base terms. We also need to specify what the last term is. Using our terms array, we're going to select the last term in the array and then set it to lowercase. Using these three variables, we can begin to build our query. First, we create a query object and then use the symbol query string search type. The field that we're going to be searching in is title.basic. And we're going to construct our query from our variables above. First, we'll take our base terms, and then to the base terms, we're going to end an expression where we want to search for the last term or the last term with the wildcard appended, which means that it'll match the full word as well as any terms that begin with our string. We also want to set our default operator to end, meaning that all words should be required. Let's test our response. If we search for Django, when we look in the hits object, there are two total hits, but none are returned. That's because we previously set our size to zero, meaning that no results would be returned. So let's set that to three, 
And we also don't want to return the entire document, so we'll use the underscore source property and specify just the title in the return. Let's double check that. Now, when we search for Perl, one hit is returned, and this underscore source object just contains the title, which is exactly what we want. Let's add our results to the get suggestions logic. First, we'll create a results variable and set it to the esreturn.hits.hits. We also want to check if the results dot length is greater than zero, and if so, set our scoped results to those results. Otherwise, we reset them. If there are results, we also want to make sure that autocomplete is shown. And we need to add results to our autocomplete object. Now to display results, we add an extra list item and use ng-repeat to loop over each result in the autocomplete.results array. Then we'll output the result underscore source dot title as its value. And we want that to be a link to the book itself, so we'll add in an external link. Now when we enter text into the search box, our autocomplete shows both term suggestions and full results, which is pretty cool. Since we added links into our autocomplete, let's also add links to our primary results so that our users can view the full details about each book. Let's also add a link to our primary results so that users can easily access the book information. Just as a note, for more specialized or robust autocomplete systems, you want to look into a tokenizing strategy called edge n-grams, and specifically Elasticsearch's implementation in the completion suggester. We've covered a lot of deep material on this course, so I'll leave that to you to research on your own once you get into more complex autocomplete scenarios. In our next section, we talk about a few relevancy tuning strategies, as well as an overview of how to deploy your search application and a few security items that you should keep in mind. We have covered a lot of ground over the course this far. This final section looks at what is required to tune and deploy the search application. We will talk about relevancy tuning, deployment strategies, and security concerns. Now it is time to look at how to tune your search results to make them more targeted and effective. Relevancy tuning is an important part of search. Elasticsearch does a good job of returning matching documents right out of the box. Understanding search ranking, we can make sure that the search results that it delivers are targeted, tuned to our specific content. We want people to be confident that they will find what they're looking for when they use our search application. Field boosts allow us to rank hits within a specific field higher than others. There are many other factors that Elasticsearch and Lucene the underlying search index used to rank documents, but field boosts are a simple way to let Elasticsearch know which data is important. Currently in our system, all fields are ranked equally. Should this be the case? In order to boost some fields higher than others, we are going to use a multi-match query. And within this, we specify our fields. In our case, we are going to specify title and give it a boost of five. Since the normal value is one, this makes it five times more important. And for the detailed description field, we are going to give it a boost of three. Finally, we are also going to search over our underscore all field, but we are not going to assign it a specific boost. Let's try out an example query. It looks like our top ranked documents have our keywords in the title as we have specified. Another key factor in many datasets is how new the information is. Once a document becomes older, it commonly becomes less useful as new information is added. This is less true in our data set because the data is somewhat evergreen. By adding a very slight decay based on when the book was published, we will serve to break any ranking ties where the documents were otherwise ranked very similarly. In order to do that, we're going to use a function score query, and we will put our multi-match query within its query sub-element. Next, we add an exponential function to our functions array. This is a decay function, and there are three potential values, exponential, Gaussian, and linear. We are going to be using our publication date field for this function, and we give it an origin of now. We set a scale 
of 365 days. Finally, we set our decay rate to 0 0.05, which should be pretty minimal. The effect shouldn't be drastic, but if there were identical passages from two editions of the same book, then it should be enough so that the newer version will show up first. By default, the function score is going to multiply our function query against the score of the document itself. We want to decrease the effects of this and just use a sum. What happens when the search engine returns too many results? In most cases, this is not a problem. The less relevant results are simply pushed further back in the list of results. However, we still want to make sure that the majority of the results are true matches. When someone searches for red car, would they be interested in every mention of red or car? No. Returning a document that mentioned red dresses would clearly not be of interest in this scenario. This is where minimum match comes in. Minimum match is a setting that determines how many query terms must be present in a document in order for it to be returned. Adding the minimum should match property and setting it to 1. This means that one word in our query has to match. So essentially, we are searching for PHP or AJAX here. When we set it to 2, both terms have to match because there are only two key words. Let's use a more detailed function. In this case, we are saying that if we search for one or two words, then all of the words have to match. If there are three or more words, then one less than the total number of words have to match. And within five words, and with five words and above, 70% of the words have to match rounded down. Now that we have made these improvements to our query, we can move this code back into our primary application. You can find the final code in the last code folder. Now that our search results are tuned to our specific data needs, it's time to look at how we might deploy this application so that it can be accessed by other users. During this course, we have built a fully functional search application. Our content is indexed and searchable. But how do we deploy it to a server so that everyone can get the same great search experience? In this video, we will cover the basics of what you need to know in order to deploy your application into the wild and make sure that it runs smoothly. In order to make sure that your application loads quickly, it is important to minify all of your images, JavaScript, and style assets. The smaller the initial download size, the faster your application will appear to users. When it comes down to it, the speed and accuracy of your search application is what matters to most people. There are several tools that will handle this minification for you. Some of the most popular are JavaScript build pipelines like Grunt or Gulp allow you to chain together multiple build steps like code hinting and automatic live reload, image minification together with general code minification. If you haven't worked with either Grunt or Gulp before, Yeoman is a great scaffolding tool that can set up a good starting point for your application. Since we are working with Angular, I would suggest trying out the Angular generator, which you can find on the Yeoman website. A build pipeline can also take care of adding a version number to the end of the compiled files so that the browser is forced to get any new documents. If you prefer to not work inside of the command line, applications like CodeKit have you covered and can do all of the work for you. Lastly, there are also websites that will allow you to paste in your uncompressed code and output it into a compressed format. The files for the client-side application can easily be hosted by S3 or any other static web host. Because the application is downloaded to the user's browser and then communicates directly with the Elasticsearch cluster, no other machines are needed in order to serve the application. The HTML, CSS, and JavaScript files can be uploaded from an FTP client, or if you want to get more complex, you can publish them as part of your build process through the Grunt AWS S3 module. That takes care of hosting the static files, but we also need to host the Elasticsearch cluster itself. And there are many ways to deploy Elasticsearch. One of the most popular options is to host it on an AWS instance. Amazon EC2 is a platform that allows you to provision virtual or physical machines. When selecting the specifics for your production environment, keep the following advice in mind. The first thing to go over is the amount of memory allocated to Elasticsearch. We touched on this at the beginning of the course, but it bears repeating. Available memory is the most important performance consideration to keep in mind when selecting the machine's specifications for your production environment. Memory is used heavily for both querying and ingestion tasks. 
It is a best practice to allocate half of the available memory of the machine up to 32 gigabytes to Elasticsearch and leave the remainder for the Lucene Index as well as any other background services. Another consideration is that because Elasticsearch is constantly reading and writing from disk, also a significant performance boost to be gained from selecting a solid state drive. You'll want to estimate your expected query load to determine if the extra cost is warranted. Those are the primary considerations to remember when selecting your machines for Elasticsearch. In the next video, we'll outline several strategies for securing Elasticsearch. Security is an important concern when deploying any web application. In this video, we will cover several approaches that can be used to protect your Elasticsearch setup from outside attacks. We already changed the default network name for a development application, but it is worth repeating that you should not use Elasticsearch as your cluster name in production. This avoids any nodes mistakenly joining the search cluster, such as when a developer computer connects to the same network, for instance. It is also advisable to rename the primary Elasticsearch folders so that the data and any other changes that you have made are not accidentally overwritten during an upgrade. By default, an Elasticsearch cluster makes itself known on the network through the multicast discovery process. This process looks for other Elasticsearch nodes on the network and adds them to the cluster. This is fine during development, but you may want to turn it off during production and use Unicast instead. Unicast takes a list of hosts that it should connect to. In order to do that, we need to disable multicast and enable unicast. We want our Elasticsearch cluster to be read-only to the outside world once we deploy it. That way, when people download our JavaScript application, it can talk directly to Elasticsearch, but no one from the outside can insert new documents or delete our index. There are two general approaches to locking down Elasticsearch. One way to achieve this is to limit the API to only respond to GET requests. One way to do this is to use the read-only REST plugin, which is available on GitHub. It is a lightweight solution, but it is definitely better than leaving Elasticsearch completely open. The preferred and more robust security option is to put a reverse proxy, such as Nginx, in front of the Elasticsearch cluster. Once the server is in place, you would set up a rule to whitelist only the GET requests, or even just the underscore search endpoint. This method can also be extended, allowing you to build out your own search API in front of Elasticsearch. And that concludes our course. Thanks for watching this series on building a search application with Elasticsearch and AngularJS. We've covered a lot of ground throughout the previous videos, and I hope that you've learned a ton in the process. You can download any accompanying resources from the PACT website. If you have questions or feedback, feel free to email me or hit me up on Twitter. I would love to see what you build on top of this. If you're working on a project that also has hard search problems, I work with a great group of search consultants at Open Source Connections, so definitely check them out. Thank you for watching.